Okay. Well, here we go. Hopefully this works out for everyone. Um, we have a lot of questions rolling in already, as, as to be expected. Uh, we did have just over 900 people register for tonight's webinar. Uh, currently, we're up to about 500 people that have, uh, maybe 550 people that have uh, connected. And um, we'll do our best here to get through everyone's questions. I know they're going to be coming fast and furious. And there is just no possible way that we're going to be able to answer everyone's questions. So right from the beginning, uh, before I get into the introductions, I'd like to say, if you have a question, um, please, by all means, uh, send it in through the questions dialog box. And I'll explain that here in a little bit. If we don't get to it uh, right now on the webinar, we will answer every question. Uh, and if a lot of questions are the same, we'll group them into one answer. And that roundup, the recap, will be emailed to everyone that has uh, registered for tonight's webinar. So don't feel lost or left out if you don't get your question answered right away. I promise you we will get to it as we move forward here. Uh, going through the slides here, a little bit of an overview of what we plan to accomplish tonight. Uh, this is, uh, like I mentioned earlier, a little bit of a lengthy presentation. And my idea is to move through it as quickly but efficiently as possible. Uh, so we're going to cover a little bit of a welcome, a quick intro to Citrix webinar got here in terms of UAS, commercial UAS operation. We're going to go over some myths and facts, the remote pilot certificate, and then spend most of our time talking about the next two bullet points, one which is 14 CFR Part 107, and the next one after that is going to be waivers and authorizations. I probably get more questions on those two bullet points than anything else uh, combined. Uh, we will cover some web-based resources for UAS pilots, stuff that manned pilots have known for a while that translate very well to unmanned aircraft operations. Go through a few real-world scenarios, and then at the end, what we'll do is we'll open up the question and answer session. And if you've dialed in, you're, you're doing uh, over the telephone or you're doing it through your computer, I will try and attempt to have you be able to answer the question verbally rather than type it in. Again, with... Um, maybe six, seven hundred people in attendance tonight. We, we literally can't get to everyone, but if we didn't get to your question or you had a hand raise or something, please type it in the question box and we will get to that question. We will email everybody the responses so everybody's on uh, the same page. So a huge welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'm very excited about is unmanned aircraft operations. It, uh, currently, uh, the last numbers I checked, uh, unmanned aircraft system registrations outnumber manned aircraft registrations two to one. And that's pretty impressive considering I think the registration portal has only been open for about 10 or 11 months. So when we're looking at the future of aircraft operations, it's hard to say that it's not UAS. So thank you for being here. Thank you for taking time to learn the system because We've finally done our part at the FAA. We've published Part 107. It's now in your hands, the operator. You folks out there conducting operations, running your business to ensure that this goes smoothly as we move forward. Um, big piece of that's education, why you guys are here, why I'm spending time at night doing this with you guys. So thank you again for joining. Um, a little bit about me, that's uh, considerably younger me uh, with a lot darker hair, but uh, back in the day, that's what I did. I drove airplanes around for an airline. Uh, I hold an airline transport pilot certificate. I'm a certified flight instructor. I also hold a remote pilot certificate. Um, obviously, I'm an FAA aviation safety inspector, and I manage the Minneapolis FISDO uh, FAST team, and I've been the point of contact for UAS in the office now for uh, uh, coming up on four years. Uh, so I've got a pretty solid background on the regulatory side of UAS. Uh, because I don't pretend to know everything, I've got a couple other people that are helping me out. Jay Flowers, who is down in uh, Oklahoma City right now, is actually the Fargo uh, FISDO Fast Team Program Manager. Um, he, he's been doing that for a while. He's actually one of the individuals that trained me in. And uh, Jay, you want to pop on and say hi real quick? Hey, how you guys doing? <laughs> All right. So there's Jay. Jay is going to be running it from the production side. So you guys furiously typing in questions, I can see scrolling up on this side of my screen here. Jay is managing that. And what he's going to do is if there's a question that's, that's pertinent, that's a, that's a good question we need to have answered, he's going to jump in, interrupt me, and I will answer that question right away. Other than that, he's going to direct questions as needed. The other individual we have is one of my uh, safety representatives. He's a volunteer from industry. He's a commercial U.S. operator. Uh, one of the founders of Man Meetup, that is uh, Aaron Sykes. Aaron, you want to say hello? 
All right. So there's Aaron. Aaron is um, is going to join us. He's going to be on board to answer questions that relate directly to operating a UAS, uh, the actual operation of it, or conducting business, uh, the business end of it. I'm not going to sit here and pretend to tell you guys I know or I'm a great UAS pilot or that I know how to start up a business. That's not my area of expertise, but certainly it's it's Aaron. So we do have a couple people here that are going to be running the production side can help you out in the background. If you guys look, we have some handouts. Uh, if you look at your what they call a grab tab, and I'll explain that in a minute, um, we have five handouts available to you. I recommend you guys download them all. They should all be in PDF format. Uh, Advisor Circle 107-2 does a fantastic job of explaining a lot of Part 107. There's also a summary of the rule, a legal interpretation that we put out for educational institutions and whether or not they cross the line into Part 107 or could they still be considered a hobby. That's a great read uh, if you're involved in an educational institution. Also the performance-based standards, which we'll cover in detail, but I, I included the, the document here for download and then some instructions on airspace and waiver uh, authorization. So some basics about the uh, uh, GoToWebinar. Apologies if you guys are all pros at this, but um, we got to make sure that everybody understands how the system works. The, the control panel that you see on the screen there, that's how you interact uh, with myself or Jay. Uh, right now, everybody's on mute, and if I did it right, you won't be able to unmute yourself. Uh, I'm going to keep it that way until we get to the question session, but certainly you could answer questions. Uh, the grab tab, which you see there, uh, you can use the orange arrow to hide it if you want to free up some screen real estate. There's also, again, that mute and unmute. However, I've kind of overridden everyone's mute, so you guys are all stuck on mute until I let you come off. And then uh, the blue box there, that allows you to view the webinar full screen. And then the other one, which we're going to use a few different times tonight, even if you don't have a question, and that's the raise the hand feature. Um, I'm going to ask a couple times, you know, by a show of hands, what I can see and what you guys can't really see, but I can see a percentage of hands raised. Uh, so I'm going to say by a show of hands, and then I'll ask you guys a question, especially when we get into the scenarios. Uh, but when we do get into the Q&A at the very end, that will be a great tool for you to raise your hand. And, we'll, we'll, again, we'll try to get to everybody. We certainly won't be able to do it. Make sure you type your question in the box if, if you're not going to get it answered uh, directly. You have your audio pane to control mic and speakers, uh, whether I'm blowing out your eardrums or I'm too quiet, adjust as necessary. And then the questions pane. If you have a question for the staff, as most of you, as I can tell by the, the screen scrolling through here, I've already figured that out, are typing in your questions. Uh, Jay and uh, Aaron will do their best to get you the answers to that. But remember, if you don't get it answered, we promise to get the answer to you in a follow-up email to everyone that registered here. So, although this is kind of a welcome screen, I'm going to give you a bunch of uh, <laughs> no signs here. Uh, we are not going to cover a few things. We are not going to cover uh, hobby operations um, other than maybe referencing it here or there. But this is not a seminar designed to teach you how to fly as a hobbyist, nor will we be discussing things like FPV drone racing. Um, I understand that's a big topic right now, and there's a lot of different opinions, and um, I'm not going to cross into that area because I don't have a solid definition to give you folks. So I'm not dodging the question. I'm just avoid giving you bad information. Anything that's ongoing lawsuit we're not going to discuss. Uh, if you have frustration with the federal government, I understand you have every right to have frustration with the federal government, but we are not going to solve that problem here tonight. Uh, also, business plans. I am not going to teach you folks how to start a UAS business, nor will this webinar prepare you to pass the UAG knowledge exam. So this is not a ground school. This is not something that you're going to watch and then go take the test and pass with 100%. So as long as we're clearing those topics not covered, I'm going to get to our first poll here. Uh, just let me launch it real quick. And uh, you folks should be able to see it on your screen. And when you do, um, go ahead and make your selections and give me an idea of where you folks are coming.
Okay, I'm going to close out the poll here in about another 10 seconds. One thing I'd like to point out, I'm, I'm kind of noticing in the, the uh, question stream as it's coming through, is that um, please limit that area to questions only. Um, I, I don't want it to be like a Facebook comment thread uh, or uh, some sort of Twitter conversation on there. The reason being is because I want to make sure the information that gets out to everyone comes straight from the source, either myself or Aaron or Jay. Uh, so if, if, if you see questions rolling through, please, please don't try to answer them in any fashion. Just simply ask the question and we'll get that to you. So I'm going to close out this poll here. And it would appear that uh, over half of you are involved with aerial, photo, uh, and video. Closely uh, followed by 22% are in data collection, the survey mapping. And then it's spread out evenly amongst, uh, it would appear, the other or bridge and tower inspection and television film production. So good stuff. Thank you for taking that uh, time to do that poll. We'll have a few more uh, others as we go through. So briefly, um, we want to go through the... Uh, a little bit of the history of why we got here. I'm not going to go into significant detail, but it's, what I want to bring up is that UAS operations aren't new. Uh, they've been around a long, long time. Uh, quite frankly, you can go all the way back to the, the 50s and 60s when you look at RC-controlled aircraft, where it really became popular was in the 70s. You had folks building these uh, from scratch or designing them from kits in their basement, and they would generally form clubs, go out and operate in sparsely populated areas uh, in, a, in a club environment. And this worked well for a really long time. Uh, in fact, in 1981, if you take a look at that on the screen, that's Advisory Circular 9157. Uh, currently, we're on Advisory Circular 9157A, which is kind of the rewrite of this. But all the way back in 1981, the FAA issued this saying, hey, we recognize you guys are flying these aircraft in the National Airspace System and they're model airplanes and you're staying away. So we came up with some guidelines and operating standards, not a rule, but certainly some standards that we expected folks to maintain in the RC community. And that worked well. It worked well all the way up uh, until uh, rather recently. I believe this was in 2012. And it changed because the knowledge and skill to operate remote control aircraft changed. If you think back in the day, you had to understand lift, thrust, weight, drag, you spent the time building it. Uh, now you can have somebody walk into a radio shack, buy a drone off the shelf, and walk out in the parking lot, hook it up to their iPad, and they're piloting a drone. They have no idea what lift, thrust, weight, drag means. That's not necessarily why Raphael Perker got into a, a situation, but this is kind of what kicked it off. Mr. Perker operated his UAS around the University of Virginia campus and medical center, taking videos swooping underneath and over and around heliports. That's what caught the FAA's attention. And what ended up happening is the FAA charged him with violate, violating a, quite a few rules under Part 91 based on the fact that we we're stating unmanned aircraft systems, or UA, are aircraft. And, of course, he fought that and said, no, it's not. It's a toy. It's my hobby. So we lost in the lower court. Uh, the lower court judge says, yeah, FAA, this is a the toy. It's not an airplane. You have no standing. Well, the FAA appealed that. It gets up to our highest appellate court, which is the NTSB. And the NTSB affirmed the FAA's position, which is, yes, unmanned aircraft systems are aircraft. So that's really the key decision we have right now and how the FAA got involved in all this anyway. Um, again, not going to debate this. I know that there's probably lawsuits and differing opinions on it. But the, the facts as it stand right now for law, unmanned aircraft system are aircraft. And you can reference that uh, NTSB decisional order there uh, with FAA versus Perker. Shortly after that, Congress enacted a law, well, the FAA uh, Reauthorization Act or Public Law 11295. This captured a lot of UAS uh, re hobby operations in it. And one of the requirements of this Public Law 11295 was that the FAA establish a means for people to operate UAS commercially in the national airspace system. The law goes into effect. Um, FAA law doesn't trump congressional public law. Uh, it, it works the other way around. So we had to come up with a rule. We had to come up with something right away. And that's where you got the exemption process, exemption 333. That was our bridge from public law 11295 coming all the way over to Part 107 operations now. Many of you attending right now may have 333 exemptions. Uh, and that was part of that process. Now, as of August 29th, we have FAR uh, Part 107. So this provides for civil, which in our discussion here, meaning commercial, 
UIS operations in the NAS. It also certificates remote pilots. So that's where we're at here today. So I'm going to bring up uh, another poll, uh, second one here, and you should be able to pop that up on your screen, and it's discussing the experience you may have operating UAS. So I'm going to let you Right, closing out the poll here in about uh, 10 seconds here I've got uh, just about 90 percent of you have participated I'm right, going to close that out uh, over half of you uh, are zero to two years followed by 31 percent in the two to five years uh, six percent five to ten years and um, only seven percent have gone 15 years plus that's fantastic news that the the zero to five year group is the group I want to reach. So I, I've really got my target audience here. Uh, that's, that's excellent. I, I appreciate that. So one thing about registration, yes, you have to register. Why do you have to register? Well, now under part 107.3, it requires it. And it references 91.203. And uh, you can see on the screen there what 91.203 states is that if anybody's operating a civil aircraft, it must have an effective U.S. registration certificate issued to the owner. So there's where the requirement uh, comes to, to register your aircraft. How do you do that? With our registration page. Uh, Registermyuas.faa.gov, I believe, is the address. If you just probably Google FAA UAS registration, it'll be your first link on there as well. Going into this page, you have two options to select, hobby or commercial. And I'm going to explain the difference real quick. As a hobbyist, you will register yourself and it's kind of a bad way to put it because nobody wants to be registered <laughs> personally to the federal government and I get it but what we're really doing is we're registering all of your hobby UAS you're gonna get one number that's applicable to every one of your devices you can label one two three four five on all ten of your UAS's that you fly for hobby under commercial you are going to register each UAS individually you will receive a unique identifier registration number and certificate for every one of your UAS and they have to be marked uh, accordingly. So if you have a commercial certificate, you may operate that UAS as a hobbyist. There's no problem with that. If you have a hobbyist certificate, you may not operate that as a commercial because each individual UAS under commercial rule has to be individually registered. So that's how the two different registrations work out. Registration is five bucks and uh, it recurs every three years. Uh, on your UAS. So what do you do when you get that number? You, you have to mark your UAS. No, you don't need 12 inch end numbers on the side, but somehow that UAS has to be labeled. Permanent marker, engraving, any means that is going to permanently identify that registration number on the UAS. The key with the registration number it has to be readily accessible, maintained in condition that is readable and legible upon inspection. You can put it in an enclosed compartment, but only if it takes no specialized tools to get at it. If it, if it takes some sort of unique one in a million screwdriver hex head to open that compartment door, you can't put it in that compartment door. We're talking tools that are available to, to just about anyone with a home repair kit. Uh, they, they have to be able to get at that. So another poll here. I'm going to keep you guys active so nobody uh, falls asleep under here, but uh, one more poll, and it, it talks about what you're currently authorized to do. About 10 more seconds here. I'm going to close out the poll. We're getting near the 90% mark again. That seems to be where kind of most polls on webinars die off. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and close it out here now. And um, it looks like 
you're split right down the middle between yes, you are currently authorized to operate, and no, you haven't taken the UAS knowledge exam yet. So that's it's right down there, half and half. So excellent representative group of folks that have done the work and are ready to go, and folks that are gearing up to do the work so they can be ready to go. Again, thanks for participating in that poll. So myth versus facts. Um, I, I kind of debated long about whether or not I should include this, but I think it's important because there's, there's far too many myths out there right now, and I'd like to dispel some of them, not all of them. However, the first one here is probably the most prominent myth I hear is I'm not getting paid, therefore I'm not a commercial operator. The fact is, anytime you're operating a UAS in furtherance of business, whether you're being compensated with cash or you're just doing it simply because it's part of your business model, that's considered a commercial operation. So realtors, nonprofits, media production, advertising, uh, demonstrations of product, anything that you're doing in furtherance of your business is considered a commercial operation. The, the one example I like to give really kind of lays it out nicely. When, when you're talking about commercial operations versus hobby operations or furtherance of business, it's on a flight by flight basis. So the example I give in a lot of my seminars is this. You're, you're a farmer, you own a lot of acreage. You bought yourself a UAS because you think they're neat, they're cool, uh, you want to fly it around, you mount a camera on the bottom, you take a lot of pictures of your property, your farm, your crops, you post those videos to YouTube, you, you put some of them up on Twitter, you hang some of the pictures on the wall, you most likely are considered a hobbyist. I don't see anything there that you, you're doing that wouldn't be considered a hobbyist operation. Same farmer, same UAS, same field, goes up and takes photographs of the crop and decides, I need to apply a particular pesticide here or I have a dry area in my field over here and then you modify your farming business based on that, you're now commercial. Nobody's paying you to do that as that farmer, but you're doing it in furtherance of your business. So that's one of the key points you have to remember. It's not you receiving a paycheck, it's the purpose and intent of your UAS mission that will put you into the hobbyist or the uh, commercial bucket. Here's another one. Uh, drones, RC airplanes, et cetera, are not aircraft. We kind of already discussed this. Uh, the fact, yes, they are. Uh, Section 40102A6 of the U.S. Code of Regulations defines any contrivance invented, used, or designed to navigate or fly in the air as an airplane. Uh, we define it in our CFR 1.1 as a device that's used to be intended to be used for flight in the air. Uh, I always get somebody in the audience at some point during my live presentation right now says, so paper airplanes are aircraft and they have to be registered. That's ridiculous. Um, no, paper airplanes are not aircraft. Uh, they cannot navigate in the air. Uh, that's a key part of that. When we get into kites and balloons, we have rules specifically for those. But we're talking about devices that are used to navigate or fly in the air. They have to be capable of flying in the air. Paper airplane doesn't meet that requirement. This came up just recently. Um, it's kind of a hot topic and it's, it's a really interesting one because it's not unique to remote pilots. It um, kind of comes across all avenues of pilot certificates. But the, the myth is rem remote pilots aren't really pilots. You guys, you're not really flying airplanes. You, you didn't take a flight check ride or, or something, a, a lot of different real. Here's the fact. I'm telling you, yes, you are. You are a certificated airman under Part 107. You have just as much remote pilot and command responsibility as pilot and command responsibility. You are a pilot. You hold a remote pilot certificate. You are operating an aircraft in the national airspace system. The grade of pilot certificate doesn't make you real or somebody more of a pilot than you. Pilots always like to say, well, you're not a real pilot until you fly this airplane, or you're not a real pilot until you get a tailwheel endorsement, or um, I hold an airline transport pilot. I could say, hey, and the private pilots aren't real pilots because they haven't done all the testing I have. All of it's ridiculous. You completed a course of training, whatever training, self-study, or paid somebody to do it, you pass an exam, you received a remote pilot certificate in the mail, you are a pilot. End of discussion. Next one, hobby or recreational operators are exempt from FAA regulations. I told you we'd talk a little bit about hobby. This may be about it here. This is not true. You are not exempt from FAA regulations simply because you self-identify as a hobbyist. Um, you are controlled by Section 336 of Public Law 
All right, you're still flying something considered an aircraft by the FAA, and you are subject to certain regulations. 9113, careless and reckless operation. Uh, 101.41, 101.43 are specifically designed for model aircraft operations in the NAS. So if somebody says, well, I'm a hobbyist, I don't have to follow the rules, that's not correct. There are certainly rules they have to follow. Not going to get into them here, but I would recommend those people uh, check them out. Here's another good one. This one will take a little bit more explanation. The FAA doesn't control airspace below 400 feet or 83 feet or 70 or 100 or 500, whatever the number happens to be. I've heard numbers all over the place. Um, fact is, yes, we are responsible for the safety of all airspace from the ground up. This includes any airspace that is defined as navigable, and that extends to the surface. Aircraft have to take off and land. Uh, unmanned aircraft have to take off and land. That, therefore, they are navigating in airspace as soon as they come off the ground. Where this came from, and what everybody likes to cite, is a 1946 U.S. Supreme Court decision um, under the U.S. versus Cosby rule. So uh, let me try to explain this a little bit. Again, we're not going to get into a heated debate on this. Um, I, I'm sure there are opinions all over the place, but here's the deal. Mr. Cosby was a chicken farmer. All right? He claimed to own airspace directly above his property. His property was located next to a military field, and as a result, you have jets coming in, taking off, landing uh, over his property as low as 83 feet. He claimed that that was killing his chickens or preventing his chickens from laying eggs, affecting his business, so he sued the government for taking over his land. That last bullet point is key in this conversation, is that it was a lawsuit brought on the illegal taking of land. So let's go into this a little bit more. The court ruled that landowners have the right to full enjoyment of their land. Okay, it referenced immediate reaches of the atmosphere. All right, they agreed that this was a government taking because it prohibited the full enjoyment of his land. Again, it's all based on land. And when, when I say it referenced immediate reaches of the atmosphere, it did that because you cannot say that a jet flying 35,000 feet over your house is ruining the full enjoyment of your land. So it had to deal with the immediate airspace around it. The actual case had to deal with land. It's a land case. So since then, there's been 70 years of law and aviation development. Congress has gone on to define navigable airspace to include airspace needed for takeoff and landing. Obviously, UAS operations expand this considerably. In order to claim taking of land, which again was the Cosby case, aircraft you have to prove aircraft are flying over your land low and frequent, and it directly and substantially interferes with your enjoyment of the land. It doesn't give you the right to the airspace. You don't own the airspace. It doesn't prohibit the FAA from regulating that airspace, but it does give landowners the right that if something's operating low and frequent, prohibiting their enjoyment or substantially interfering with it, they may have a case under Cosby. But what happens is people take that as, 83 feet, I own the airspace, and that's not true. It only applies to the taking of land. All right, the FAA has the authority from Congress to regulate navigable airspace. Moving on. Here's another myth. The FAA prohibits transporting property under Part 107. All right, the photo on this was a, it was a big thing. I think it made CNN. It was a, a beer company that was going to use uh, drones to deliver beer to ice houses out on the lake in Minnesota. Yes, we're a little crazy here. We fish on the ice in the middle of the wintertime. Nonetheless, that was their plan. I, whether it was practical or not, it didn't matter. But here's the fact. Yes, transportation of property is permitted under Part 107. The problem is it's not very practical at the moment. Why? When transporting property under Part 107, you must tran the transportation must occur wholly within the bounds of a state. That means you cannot transport property from one state line or across a state line from one state to another. It has to be within the state. The UAS must remain within visual line of sight at all times, and that cannot be waived. When we get into the waiver portion of this evening, you're going to see a lot of rules that can be waived. You cannot waive that if you're going to be transporting property. You cannot operate from a moving vehicle, and you cannot be transporting hazardous materials. So, yes, you can transport property under Part 107. However, Probably not that practical for everybody's business plans that they really want to do, Amazon included. Another poll for you guys. Make sure everybody's awake here. This is just a poll I want to do to see how many folks out there are actually certificated 
filed under Part 61. All right, about 10 seconds, we'll close out that poll, get near that magical 90% number again here. I'm going to close that out. So I, I'm loving the results of these polls so far, and I'll tell you why. 70% uh, of people responded no, that they are not a certificated Part 61 pilot. That's fantastic news because you guys will truly benefit from this seminar. Um, most people beyond that were private pilots, and some had commercial or ATP uh, certificates, but Almost three quarters of you are going to find out a lot of information about how to read rules, how to deal with the FAA regulations, how to understand them. This is going to be a good seminar for you folks, again. So moving right into remote pilot certificates, how do you earn your remote pilot certificate? Some of you have already done this. Some of you are on your way. Uh, the one thing you're going to want to do to make sure the process is expedited as much as possible is create an account through IACRA. That's our Integrated Airman Certificate, uh, Certification and Rating Application System. It actually does work pretty well. Uh, I've got a lot of good feedback from folks saying that they were pleased with how fast the process worked. You always have the option to do it on paper. You can, you can print out the paper. It, it will just take a little longer. So create an account through IACRA. It's free to do. It expedites the process. Obviously the preferred way to do it. If you are a first time pilot, so this applies to, again, almost three-quarters of the people here in attendance. Uh, if you're not a current Part 61 pilot, you are also considered a first-time pilot, meaning if you do not meet 6156 flight review requirements, but you hold a private pilot certificate, you have to follow this process as a first-time pilot. So the first thing you need to do, other than study, and I can't emphasize that enough, you need to study. We have some study guides published. Um, there's a lot of courses out there. I'm not here to promote one or the other. Do your research and study. After that, schedule the appointment with the Knowledge Testing Center and pass your initial aeronautical knowledge test. That test is going to include areas on regulations uh, relating to privileges, limitations, and operation, airspace, weather, um, loading and performance of the small unmanned aircraft, emergency procedures, crew resource management, uh, which may be a foreign term to you at this point. Um, also, radio communication procedures may be in there, determining performance of your small unmanned aircraft, the physiological effects of drug and alcohol, you need to understand those, as well as ADM, or aeronautical decision making and judgment. You obviously need to know airport operations, and then maintenance and pre-flight inspection procedures. So there's a lot of information that you're going to need to know to pass that exam. Once you pass the exam, and right now we're hovering around 87 to 88% success rate, for people taking their um, exam the first time. That, that's a fantastic number. It means people are doing their homework. Once you pass that test, you're going to complete your FAA Form 8710-13. We speak in numbers here all the time. What that really means is you're going to go back into IACRA and you're going to complete a remote pilot cer certificate application. Once the TSA vets your background, you will receive an email, automated email from IACRA that will allow you to log back in and print out your temporary certificate. Um, later on, the remote pilot permanent certificate will be sent to you in the mail, but that's taking a while. Uh, some people are starting to get theirs now, but it's probably going to be coming in waves. The key to remember of first-time pilots or non-current Part 61 pilots is that there's no additional signatures necessary. You don't have to go find a CFI. You don't have to visit the FISO. You don't have to go find a designated pilot examiner. Complete the application and submit it. Uh, Oklahoma City and Airman Records takes care of your uh, vetting and processing of the application. So another poll here, and then uh, this may be one of the last polls we see for a while here, but I'm curious to find out how many folks are registered through fasafety.gov.
All right, we're climbing back up to my magic number again here. I'm going to close out the poll here because it's not that difficult of a, of a choice to make there. But uh, three-quarters of you are um, registered with FA Safety Gov. That's fantastic news. There are two WINGS credits that are applying to this seminar. Um, if you haven't registered through FASafety.gov, obviously you've registered through Citrix because you're here. But if you have not registered through FASafety.gov, please go there, find this uh, seminar or find this webinar. It's going to be, you can search the entire U.S. It'll be on there, same title and everything. And make sure you register uh, so you can get the appropriate WINGS credit. I'm not going to do a huge presentation on um, FA WINGS because for the unmanned aircraft system pilot, uh, the remote pilot, I should say, it, we're not fully up to speed yet to make that 100% useful for you guys. But thank you for those of you who are. If not, take a poke around FASafety.gov. Um, there's a lot of good information on there for manned pilots. There's some decent stuff on there for unmanned aircraft pilots. It, it'll get better as time goes on. So, again, moving on. So, now if you're a current Part 61 Certificated Airman, the applicate process is a little bit different. Um, if you're not a student pilot and you're current with your flight review, you're going to complete your online course through FAAsafety.gov, which has like a 30-question kind of exam at the end that corrects to 100%. The difference being once you complete that, you're going to need to visit a DPE or an uh, aviation safety inspector like myself or a CFI or an ACR uh, to process your application. Out of all of those, the only one that cannot give you your temporary certificate right away is the CFI. They don't have the authority to do that, but you could get your temporary certificate immediately uh, with visiting a, a FISDO, a ASI, or a DPE, uh, something of that nature. Um, again, if you do a CFI and you're a certificated airman, you're going to get an automated reply. It seems to hover around seven days for those of you who are not Part 61 pilots from the time you submit to the time that you receive your email for your temporary, and about four hours for those that are Part 61 pilots. Uh, pilots going through IACRA um, who are not obviously visiting a DPE or a, an ASI. The, the big difference in time is because for Part 61 pilots, you've already been vetted by the TSA. So that's kind of complete. They don't have to do that additional background check on you. That's what your remote pilot certificate's going to look like. Um, I can say for a fact that, that is what they look like. I don't have mine yet, but uh, I have my temporary and I'm waiting like a lot of people, but I've seen some posted online and that's, that's certainly what they look like. Um, again, I want to drive home the point that is an airman certificate, and you hold a remote pilot certificate with a small unmanned aircraft system rating. You are a pilot. Currency, just because you get your certificate doesn't mean you're done. Uh, periodically, uh, you have to update the required aeronautical knowledge to continue to operate in the National Aerospace System. This is done through either a recurrent training course or recurrent knowledge test, and it has to be done every 24 calendar months. Uh, what is that test going to be like? Uh, I don't know. We haven't issued it yet because nobody needs it yet. <laughs> we just published the rule. Nobody has their certificates in, in, until at least August. Or I should say nobody has to complete it until at least August of uh, 2018. But here's kind of a good table. I'm not going to read through the table. Um, I, I do my best not to read PowerPoint to you folks. Uh, but you can take a look at that and see precisely how the recurrent training cycle works. If you pass it on this day, when you need to train by, what if you don't? What happens is it the clock is reset. So screenshot that or whatever. Hopefully I can get this uh, published after I record it and you guys will see that again. But um, I believe I took this out of Advisory Circular 107-2, so not too hard to find. Uh, the return training course is going to include applicable regs, emergency procedures, CRM, maintenance and pre-flight uh, inspection procedures. Again, we don't have the course developed yet, so I can't specifically tell you what it's like. Is it going to be the same as the UAG knowledge exam? Not quite sure. Uh, we'll have to wait probably a good year before we see some of that. All right. Uh, so here we go. I hope you guys have your uh, popcorn ready and your favorite beverage in hand because we're about to get into the meat of this presentation. I do have a planned break ahead um, probably another 25 minutes before we hit that mark. So bear with me as we uh, get into the rules here with 14 CFR Part 107. We are going to go through, <clears throat> excuse me, every rule, okay? We are going to go through every rule. For those rules which um, aren't that clear or I felt need to be explained a little bit uh, in more detail, I'm going to do that. Uh, but some of the rules are pretty straightforward. So we're not going to spend a half hour talking about one particular rule when it's uh, easy to understand. 
the first thing, Part 107.1, applicability. So who does this rule apply to? Uh, every one of our rules starts out with kind of a dot one applicability. And this particular rule applies to registration, airman certification, and operation of small unmanned aircraft systems within the U.S. We're talking civil, commercial, uh, UAS operations. It doesn't apply to air carrier, any aircraft subject to Part 101, which includes hobbyists and model or operations under Section 333. I want to explain that one last bullet point on there. If you hold a 333 exemption, it's still valid as long as it hasn't expired with the expiration date that's published on there. But assuming you hold a valid 333 exemption, you can still use that exemption, but you have to choose which bucket you're going to fly out of. You're either going to fly out of the exemption, 333, or Part 107, but you cannot do both. So if you choose to operate on your 333 exemption, maybe you have some specific COAs that go with it and it gives you more opportunity. You can still operate under that. You have to follow all the conditions and limitations on your 333 exemption and any pertinent COAs that go with it. And you may operate commercially using that exemption. If you choose to operate on Part 107, you have to push aside any special COAs or privileges you might have had in that exemption and follow all the rules under Part 107. So both are still valid but you have to pick one or the other and you can't combine them. So part one three here, 107.3, goes into definitions. We define what a control station is, what corrective lenses are, what a small unmanned aircraft is. Uh, so for this rule, a small unmanned aircraft is anything weighing less than 55 pounds on takeoff, including everything you may attach to it, everything that's on board, cameras, whatever it happens to be. That means if the aircraft, small unmanned aircraft, weighs 60 pounds, you may not operate that commercially under Part 107. 107 only applies to small unmanned aircraft, and they define that as, I should say, we define that as something that weighs less than 55 pounds on takeoff. We talk about unmanned aircraft, unmanned aircraft systems, small unmanned aircraft system. When we're talking about SUAS or UAS, we're talking about everything involved. That's the aircraft, it's the data link, it's the control station, it's the flight controls, it's the computer software required to run it. That is the small unmanned aircraft system. It's kind of a holistic approach to it. Otherwise, we're talking about unmanned aircraft. And that's specifically the device that's flying in the national airspace system. Visual observer is defined. Uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit later on, but a visual observer is designated by the remote pilot and command to help them keep the um, UA in visual line of, of sight at all times. Um, we'll, we'll get into this a little bit later on. It's not meant to be a daisy chain extension. So it's not meant to be, I've got a visual observer, he's a mile away, so I'm going to fly it over his head and then go a mile beyond him. I can't see it, but he can. That's not how the visual observer system works. So hang with me, we'll, we'll get there. 107.5 talks about falsification, reproduction, or alteration. Essentially saying you cannot do anything that falsifies any record required by the FAA. That's your remote pilot certificate. That could be uh, uh, operations manual that you might have as part of a waiver you've received. Certainly would apply to your waiver or ATC authorizations. You can't alter or falsify any of that. Registration would be filed. If you do, um, you're, you're looking at some pretty serious consequences. We, they can be denial of application. Um, we can deny your certificate of waiver, suspension or revocation. Um, or even civil penalty. We can, at the FAA, we can fine uh, people for uh, violations of the regulation. From personal experience in dealing with some cases uh, where I did investigations that involved falsification, uh, it's generally revocation. Uh, it's, it's one of the few things it seems like the FAA, we don't take lightly. Um, this is highly uh, an honor-based system. We don't have enough inspectors to watch what you do every single day in the field. We are not going to be there for every single takeoff and landing. We expect you to operate as professional pilots in the national airspace system. And as such, falsification goes against every ethical standard we'd have as a professional. And therefore, I've seen the FAA go very diligently after pilot certificates for falsification. So it's certainly something that's real, and it's certainly something that's very uncommon. I should emphasize that. So 107.7, as a remote pilot in command, RPIC, I'm going to start using a lot of abbreviations to fit this stuff on the screen. Um, you must make available to the administrator your remote pilot certificate, 
with a small U.S. rating, any other document or record, such as a certificate of waiver, or any test or inspection of the SUS that the person manipulating the flight controls uh, to, to determine compliance of that part. So what it's saying is that if an FAA inspector, who is a representative of the administrator, comes up and decides to do a ramp check, um, it's going to be one of those things that you're, you are required to provide that documentation. You can't say, I'm not going to give it to you. Uh, so this codifies that, that if you do get visited by an FAA inspector, hopefully it's a positive experience, and they're going to ask to see certain things, and this is where they're getting that authority from. All right, accident reporting. This is a little bit different than manned aircraft. So we have a specific rule under 107.9 that identifies you must report accidents, certain accidents, to the FAA. We, we don't have this rule necessarily under Part 91, uh, general aviation operations. There is a requirement to report to the NTSB, but 107 is a little bit unique in the fact that we have a rule that requires you to report directly to the FAA. So we define an accident as any serious injury to a person or loss of consciousness or damage to any property other than the actual unmanned aircraft that is greater than $500 to repair or replace whichever is lower. So let me kind of explain that. If the UA hits something that has a value of $300 and it costs $600 to replace it, that the, the value is lower. That wouldn't constitute reporting. It has to be um, over $500 in value or um, over $500 with the repair and the replace. So how do you do it? How do you report it? Well, you can take a look at the screen there. We have some numbers. These are our regional operations center. They run uh, 24 hours a day, uh, taking phone calls for precisely these types of events. Uh, depending on where your state is, or I should say, depending on where the accident occurred, is going to give you a, a few different phone numbers to call. If you don't want to call, <clears throat> excuse me, you can do it online. Uh, FAA.gov forward slash UAS, I believe is our main website has an accident reporting link on that website. You click on it, that window will pop up and you can submit your accident report that way. Uh, very easy to do. I guess my, what I would probably do is just submit it online here. It seems much simpler than trying to call somebody and explain it to them. Uh, but we do offer that uh, accident reporting portal online. Another quiz here. This one is going to be a little bit different. This is going to be a quiz, and I want to see what you guys come up with and answer. So it wouldn't be an FAA presentation if we didn't have a quiz. So here we go. Best of luck to everyone. All right, getting ready to close it out here, about 10 seconds, getting a, a pretty good response back from you guys. So I'm going to close it out. The answer uh, to whether or not you can fly under a 333 exemption COA and Part 107 simultaneously is no, you may not. Uh, think back to the, what I explained between that 333 and Part 107. You have to pick one or the other. And if you have a COA that's attached to the 333 exemption, and you want to use that COA, you must use your 333 exemption in its entirety and not 107. Um, if you're going to operate under 107, you don't get any of the provisions in your 333 exemption, one or the other. you got to pick. All right, some operating rules. This is the, the meat. This is what everybody likes to talk about here. So uh, applicability. These rules under Part 107 for operations of small unmanned aircraft apply to any aircraft systems unmanned subject to this part. Now, which ones are subject to this part? We covered that in 107.1, which is anything that's uh, under 55 pounds, uh, and so on and so forth. We do require you to have a remote pilot certificate with a small unmanned aircraft system rating. The rule reads, except as provided, no person may manipulate the flight controls of the small UAS unless they have a remote pilot certificate with a small US rating, or, this is a big or, that person is under the direct supervision of the remote pilot in command, and the remote pilot in command has the ability to take direct control 
of the flight of the SUS. SUS. Now, I apologize for reading that word for word for you guys, um, but some of these, uh, I unfortunately, have to do that. The key point is that whoever is operating the SUA, uh, SUA under Part 107 has to either hold a remote pilot certificate issued under this part or have that person who holds a remote pilot certificate standing right next to them with the ability to take command of that small UI if something goes wrong. So that's the difference. You can have somebody operate your small unmanned aircraft under Part 107 without a remote pilot certificate as long as somebody who has a remote pilot certificate is near them. Now, <clears throat> we get into a remote piloting command. So you have your remote pilot certificate, and the FAA has this other thing called a remote piloting command. Um, folks that are current, or I should say that hold Part 61 pilot certificates, are very familiar with the term piloting command. So I'm going to bring it to you guys as well, remote piloting command. The rule states, except as provided, nobody be, uh, no person may act as a remote pilot in command unless they have a remote pilot certificate with a small U.S. rating. We require a remote pilot in command on every flight. There is an exception in there. It has to deal with civil, foreign, registered, small unmanned aircraft. I'm not going to really get into that. For the purposes of our discussion, every single UAS flight under Part 107 must have a designated remote pilot in command who holds a remote pilot certificate. As you saw in the previous slide, that person doesn't necessarily need to be flying the UAS, but if they are not, they need to be right next to the person that is, particularly if that person does not have a remote pilot certificate. We do not require medical certification for you to operate your UAS under Part 107. You don't need a third class medical. You don't have to visit an airman medical examiner. However, if you have any reason, whether you know or have reason to know that you have a physical or mental condition which would interfere with the safe operation of the SUAS, you may not operate under Part 107. This is a big self-certification piece. So if you go out and you've got some sort of medical issue or you should know that you have a medical issue and you choose to operate and something goes wrong, the burden is on you for that medical self-certification to say, I, you know, I know I couldn't see straight yesterday, but I decided to fly anyway, and I hit a tree. Okay, well, if you can't see straight, how did you have a reason to believe that you wouldn't interfere with the safe operation? The bottom line is it's self-certifying. You go out, are you physically, physiologically capable of flying that UAS safely? That's what we need to know. So again, a remote pilot in command, 107.19, must be designated before or during the flight of the small unmanned aircraft. Um, they are directly responsible for and have the final authority as to the safe operation of that small UAS in the NAS. They have to ensure that it doesn't pose any undue hazard to other people, aircraft, property, in case that UA loses control for any reason. So they must ensure that the UAS complies with all of Part 107. If you're the remote pilot in command, you are the captain of that aircraft. You're wearing the four stripes. You go to the airplane terminal, airline terminal, you see the pilots walk around, four stripes on the shoulder, they're the captain. They're going to be the pilot in command. You guys are going to be the remote pilot in command of your aircraft. All right? You must have the ability to direct the small MN aircraft to ensure compliance. All right? you, you're in charge. It all falls on your shoulder. So here's one of my first explanation screens for you guys. So the remote pilot in command should have their certificate easily accessible during flight operations. Again, one of the things that the FAA inspector could ask you if they happen to visit you during one of your uh, operations or one of your missions is they are going to ask to see your remote pilot certificate if you're going to be the remote pilot in command. So you should have that with you. It shouldn't be somewhere in your car or at home. It's, it's uh, something you're going to want to carry with you. All manned aircraft pilots carry it with them at all times. I recommend the same for you guys. Point number two. As the remote pilot in command, again, you're the captain, and as such, you may go down with the ship. That seems a little bit harsh, but the buck stops with you. If you've identified that you are the remote pilot in command for this particular UAS mission that's happening, whether you're flying it or you're standing next to somebody that's operating it with the ability to take control if you need to, and something goes wrong, we are going to talk to the remote pilot in command. We will talk to the captain. We will want to know why the captain allowed something to happen. It's the way shipping works out. It's the way aircraft, airlines, aviation has worked out as well. 
What 107.19 does allow is transfer of control of a small UAS between certificated remote pilots, meaning you can pass off that remote pilot and command responsibility. In transferring control, what we require is that both of you are capable of maintaining visual line of sight without any loss of control. It can't be done where one of you loses sight of it momentarily. The transfer of control of remote pilot and command responsibility and authority must happen while both of you can see the UA. So you have one pilot designated as the RPIC at the beginning of the flight, and at some point during the operation, you can transfer that responsibility and control as long as it's done in a positive manner so that nobody is doing this when something goes south. That happens. So if you're going to be transferring remote pilot command authority, it must be clear and unambiguous, meaning you've got the aircraft, you're remote pilot command. Roger, I've got the aircraft, now I'm remote pilot command. However it works out. What you don't want to have happen is, I think I pass it off to that guy, and now it just went through the school window, and the FAA and the police just showed up, and he was remote pilot in command, and he's like, oh, no, 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 you were the remote pilot in command. I never took... That has to be positively communicated between the two of you. If you have an in-flight emergency requiring immediate action, you may deviate from any part of this rule to the extent necessary to meet that emergency. It doesn't give you a blank check to violate every rule in the book, but it certainly gives you the green light to deviate from any rule on this part needed to ensure the safety of the NAS. If something's going wrong with your UAS and you've got an in-flight emergency, whatever it happens to be, do whatever it takes to keep the national airspace system safe and do whatever it takes to keep people around you safe. You are the captain. You save the ship. You save the people. That's your job. Deviate from the rules as necessary. If you do that, you may be asked to submit a report. It's not mandatory. This is not an accident mandatory report. This is I had to declare an emergency. I was about to lose uh, battery power on my small unmanned aircraft. It was in a hazardous area, so I had to operate um, over people to get it out of there in time. Okay, if the FAA comes up and they, they become aware of that, we may ask you just to submit a, a brief statement on that. We're not looking to violate you. We're looking to gather data, gather information on that. You may not have to submit a report. The only thing that really concerns me, coming from a safety standpoint as an FAA safety inspector, and I've been doing this now not that long, for about nine years, is when we have an event that happens, it's an in-flight emergency, whether it's unmanned or manned aircraft, and nobody declares an emergency. Um, there's no reason not to. Uh, we're, we're not going to come kicking in your door and taking all your toys. Uh, we're not coming there with golden scissors to cut up your pilot certificate. I would rather have you declare an emergency, use 107.21 as your authority to deviate from the rule rather than try to keep complying with the rule and have something really bad happen. That's where I start to get um, a lot more questions asked of people. It's like, well, why, why don't you just kind of go with the emergency rule and, and, and do this? I, I'd rather see you use the emergency rule in a true emergency than not. In terms of hazardous operation, you may not operate in a careless or reckless manner. Pretty straightforward, not that difficult to understand. You don't want to be endangering people or property or anything like that. You cannot drop anything from a small unmanned aircraft that creates an undue hazard to persons or property. So, can you drop something from a small unmanned aircraft? It would appear so, as long as it's done in a manner that doesn't create an undue hazard to persons or property. We have the same rule for manned aircraft. So, it's almost word for word when we took it and parsed it into Part 107. You can operate your small UA from a moving vehicle. All right? It cannot be from an aircraft. <laughs> I don't know why anybody would try to do that, but it can't be from an aircraft. And you can only operate it from a moving land or waterborne vehicle over a sparsely populated area, and it cannot be transporting property. Again, this goes back to the, yeah, you can transport property under Part 107, but we have some rules that, that don't really make it um, easy to do. This is kind of one of them. So, if you're going to be operating from a moving land vehicle, car, truck, or a waterborne vehicle, boat, jet ski, um, it has to be done over a sparsely populated area, and it can't be done for compensation or for hire. Um, what's a, spot, a sparsely populated area? We don't define it. Um, 
much to the chagrin probably of many FAA and safety inspectors over the year, we have no formal definition of sparsely populated area. We leave that up to the operator to determine that caveat. Um, I wish I had a better answer for you guys, but if you're going to say I'm going to operate from a, a moving vehicle, I've determined this area to be sparsely populated, that's on your shoulders. If the FAA inspector comes out and says, well, this is like the middle of downtown Atlanta, where are you getting that from? That will be up to you and the courts and something to decide later on. But we do not define sparsely populated area. So um, you can Google it and try to find some answers. Some lawyers have written about it uh, in different cases, but officially there's no definition for that. So again, you can operate from a land or waterborne vehicle over a sparsely populated area. It doesn't remove any visual line of sight community, uh, requirements. You still have to maintain VLOS with your small UA. And you got to make sure that it doesn't unfairly risk any people or property or anything of that nature. Alcohol or drugs. Um, right now we have a rule in 107, 107.27, that redirects you to another rule in Part 91. This is fairly common when you get into reading FAA regulations. Any part certificated uh, 61 pilot will tell you that you read one rule that references this, this, unless this rule over here says this, this, which ties you to that rule over there. It's how the rules are written. So welcome to the FAA, welcome to our rules. 107.27 will redirect you to 91.17 and 91.19, which state Within eight hours after consumption of alcohol, you may not operate a UAS. You've got to have what the pilots like to say, eight hours bottle to throttle. You've got to have that time in between. Um, if you're under the influence of alcohol or any drugs, or if you have a, a blood alcohol content of 0 0.04 or greater, you may not operate under Part 107. Daylight. You may not operate at night. Um, you may operate in periods of civil twilight. Uh, as long as your small unmanned aircraft have anti-collision lighting on it that can be seen for at least three miles. Uh, Civil Twilight, as you see on the screen there, talks about 30 minutes before official sunrise and ends at official sunrise and then beginning at official sunset and then carrying on for 30 minutes after that. Um, folks that might be tuning in from Alaska, it's totally different up there. Sometimes the sun just never sets for you guys, so please check specific rules when we get into the Alaska stuff, but you may operate during the day in civil twilight, um, as long as you have those anti-collision lights that can be seen for three miles. What does that mean? We have no certification standards for small unmanned aircraft, let alone lighting systems. So a lot of people say, well, you got to comply with Part 23 or you know, it's some sort of aircraft certification requirement. We don't have that. This is a performance-based standard, a performance-based rule, meaning that you just have to demonstrate your lighting on the UAS can be seen for three miles or should be able to be seen for three miles. That's the requirement. There is no minimum luminosity. There's no specifications for lights. We don't do any of that. It's a performance-based rule. So can you see that uh, from three miles away? If so, then you're good to go. Visual line of sight. Here's another big one here, folks. 107.31. Um, you have to maintain visual line of sight of your UAS. That is unaided by anything other than corrective lenses. So that goes for the remote pilot in command. It goes for the visual observer and anybody manipulating the flight controls. They have to be able to see the unmanned aircraft throughout the entire flight to know the location, altitude, attitude, direction. Uh, they have to be able to observe the airspace for any hazards, other aircraft, perhaps birds. Um, and you have to ensure that the aircraft doesn't endanger life or property of another. That has to be done by the remote pilot in command and the visual observer. You can't pass that off. It has to be within visual line of sight at all times. So throughout the entire flight, the ability to describe what I just talked about must be exercised by either the remote pilot in command of the SUS or a visual observer. And I'm going to explain this here real quick. I'm going to jump back to my screen here. The, the, the intent of this visual observer is not to relieve the remote pilot of command of VLOS responsibility. It is designed to allow the remote pilot of command to temporarily lose visual line of sight with his UAS by looking down, adjusting something, working on a system component or software component of what they're trying to do. The visual observer can maintain visual line of sight with that aircraft while the remote pilot's heads down. 
It doesn't mean that that device can be flown somewhere or the RPIC can't see it, but the visual observer can. So if a visual observer is used during that operation, all the following requirements must be met. So again, the remote pilot command and the visual observer must maintain effective communication with each other at all times. That means I have to be able to talk to you, you have to be able to talk to me. That can be done electronically, walkie-talkie, cell phones. Um, we, we don't get into too much detail on that, but we do specify effective communication. So whatever communication medium you're going to use between the remote pilot command and your visual observer, it has to work. It has to be effective. All right, so the remote pilot command must ensure that the visual observer is able to see the UA in the manner specified previously. Again, it has to maintain visual line of sight. We don't have a rule that permits beyond visual line of sight operations. So coordination between the two is outlined in 107.33. This is coordination between the visual observer and the remote pilot and command. Uh, the coordination is designed to scan the airspace where you're operating your small unmanned aircraft to identify any potential collision hazards and maintain awareness of the position through direct visual observation. Again, that ties to me as a remote pilot looking down, temporarily adjusting something for some reason. I've got my VO who's watching my UAS, whether it's in a hover mode or whether it's tracking a GPS track. I have that ability to maintain visual line of sight with it because I can always look up and see it but they are physically eyes on the bird at any given time. Now, unless properly certificated and equipped, visual observers cannot assume remote pilot and command responsibilities. You can't pass off your RPIC duties to your visual observer unless they happen to be a remote pilot and have that certificate and they accept that responsibility. So they assist you again. If you go eyes down, the visual observer is there to assist you. Um, you still, as a remote pilot of command, must be able to see your unmanned aircraft within visual line of sight at all times. This doesn't relieve anybody of any of that. And effective communication must take place. Now, don't necessarily care how you do it, but you have to have effective communication between the visual observer because if the visual observer is far enough away where maybe they, um, they can't shout at you very effectively because of highway noise or something like that, and you go heads down and they see something happening that's dangerous, they have to be able to communicate with you instantly, uh, whatever means uh, you do that. So that could be voice, handheld radio, any real method that creates an effective communication and does not create a distraction. Um, texting probably isn't the best idea to maintain uh, effective communications between a VO and the RPIC. In terms of operating multiple small unmanned aircraft, you may not. A person may not operate or act as a remote pilot in command or visual observer of more than one unmanned aircraft at the same time. Now, this is going to be one of those rules that's waivable. We'll get to that here in a little bit. You cannot carry hazardous material. And for the purposes of Part 107, we define hazmat as, I'm just going to let you guys read that. Um, it, it goes to the Secretary of Transportation that talks about health and transporting and commerce, things like that. We pull a definition out of 49 CFR 171.8. So that's how we define hazardous material. All right, pretty exciting stuff there. i give you guys a second to read that and jumping forward. If you're going to operate near aircraft, here are the right-of-way rules under Part 107. You must, as a small unmanned aircraft remote pilot, remote pilot in command, yield the way uh, to all aircraft, airborne vehicles, launch, and reentry vehicles. Uh, you have the responsibility to get out of the way. Uh, in terms of operating near them, uh, you may not pass over, under, or ahead of it unless you are well clear. What does well clear mean? Look at it from a safety standpoint. Uh, you want to be so far away that it's not going to create an undue hazard. Be well clear. You may not operate so close to another aircraft to cause a collision hazard. Pretty self-explanatory on that one. Operating over people. Oh, this is a good one everybody likes to talk about, and uh, especially... Uh, since uh, our administrator mentioned it was one of the first rules that we're going to be looking at here short term uh, to potentially modify, we'll have to see. But 107.39 prohibits operating over a human being. Apparently aliens are okay. Uh, unless that human being is directly participating in the operation of that small unmanned aircraft or they're located in a covered structure or inside a stationary vehicle uh, that provide reasonable protection in case that UA came down on their head. Uh, the first bullet point under there is where everybody starts to kind of diverge in terms of 
who is directly participating in the operation of that small unmanned aircraft. So here's what we define. Uh, this, I believe, comes straight out of uh, Advisory Circular 107-2, which is one of the handouts you can download. People directly involved with the operation of the small unmanned aircraft system are the remote pilot in command or another person manipulating controls as provided by rule here, the visual observer, or any crew members necessary for the safety of the small unmanned aircraft system operation as assigned and briefed by the remote PIC. So one of the questions we get a lot, what about actors? Um, what about the movie talent or whatever it happens to be? Are they participating in the operation because we're filming their scene with the UAS? The way this reads is no. The actors or talent involved are not directly participating in the operation of the small unmanned aircraft system. You got to look at those four bullet points. The, the, the people you can fly over legally under Part 107.39 are one of those four groups. Um, either the pilot in command, the manipulating the controls, the VO, or crew members necessary for the safety of the operation. Um, actors, talent aren't necessary for the safety of the operation. Uh, filming a marathon, you can't you can't tack up a, a sign that says, hey, we're going to be shooting this marathon with the UAS. You guys are all participating now. It doesn't work like that. Um, they have to be directly related to the safety of the UAS operation. On to the next exciting subject, operating in certain airspace. The rule states, unless prior authorization from ATC is given, nobody may operate an unmanned aircraft system in Class Bravo, Charlie, Delta, or and here's the mouthful of words, the lateral boundaries of the surface area of Class E airspace designated for an airport. What that last bullet point is really saying is Class E to the surface. So I'm going to kind of reference that as E to the surface from now on, but we're talking about the lateral boundaries of the surface area. Of, okay, you guys have seen that enough. Operating in the vicinity of airports, you may not operate in a manner that interferes with operations at traffic patterns at any airport, heliport, or seaplane base. Notice this is different from a lot of what Exemption 333 allowed and what uh, are required of hobby operators. Your typical Class G airport does not require ATC authorization to operate around. However, you must maintain compliance with 107.43. So let me explain that a little bit. Although it doesn't require notification to the airport operator, it's best practice to do so. Uh, one of the first things I mentioned to you guys at the beginning of this webinar was that it's on your shoulders now. It, it, it's really up to you guys to determine how the future of UAS is going to work with the FAA, with, with public perception. It, it's on your shoulders. So everything you can do to make people understand what you're doing and how you're complying with the rule and how you're doing this safely is going to benefit the entire industry. I, I really can't emphasize that enough. So. Just because a rule says you don't have to tell the airport operator you're going to be flying a UAS near the airport, it's still not a bad idea to let them know. Open up that dialogue with them. Start that communication. Um, you might be surprised how well you're, you're received. Um, so again, it, it, it applies to airports, heliports located within Class G airspace. If you're going to operate near an airport, the RPIC must be aware of all the traffic patterns and approach corridors to runways and landing areas. You have to understand when they're blind and not understanding the runway layout or what active runway is being used that particular day or where the aircraft are inbound from. Um, you have to avoid operating anywhere where the presence of your SUAS may interfere with operations. This includes approach corridors, obviously, but taxiways, runways, helipads. And obviously, you still have to give right away to all of the aircraft, including aircraft operating on the surface. So just because something's taxing by doesn't mean you've got the right of way. You always have to, to give away. One of the explanations they give in Advisory Circular 107-2 is this. If you're hovering your unmanned aircraft 200 feet above a runway, and let's say there's no other airplanes around and you've done your due diligence, and now you've got an airplane that taxis up and is holding short of the runway, and they cannot take off because you're hovering over there. In effect, you have interfered with the operations at the traffic pattern at an airport and would be in violation of 107.43. So before you go carte blanche operating into airports in Class G or heliports or seaplane bases, have a very good understanding of how that airport operates. How do you do that? 
contact the airport operator, open up that dialogue, open up that discussion, be safe. Operating in prohibited or restricted areas, not that different than manned aircraft. You may not operate a small end aircraft in prohibited or restricted areas unless you have permission from the using or controlling agency as appropriate. Huh? For, for, for folks that aren't really in tune with how that works, that's what is the using agent or controlling agency? So what I have on the screen now is a restricted area. This is straight off a sectional chart. Now keep in mind, this is not a lesson to teach you how to pass the UAS knowledge exam. But I want to emphasize this part here, 107.45. Restricted area 4103, that shows up on the map. Um, I'm going to try something which to me is like next level cool because I'm a little bit old. But say you wanted to operate in this area here that I've circled on the map um, horribly. Say you wanted to operate in that area. Could you? How, how do you know? What, does it go to the surface? Who do I contact? Is it part of this Miller uh, Army Air Force uh, base? You know, what is that? So here's, here's what we do. You have to look at the side panel of the sectional. If you've never owned a sectional, um, they're getting harder to find these days, but go out and try to find one. What you'll find is this is what the side panel looks like. This is for the particular Twin Cities sectional chart. If you go down, you find the special use airspace, and you see, oh, restricted area R4301. That's the one I want to operate in. Oh, it goes up to 27,000 feet, so it absolute, absolutely includes the surface. And when is it used? Uh, looks like 7.30 a.m. to midnight, uh, and uh, other times by NOTAM. Uh, they will notify me 24 hours in advance. The controlling agency, Minneapolis Center. So I'm going to jump back to this picture. Who would you contact to receive ATC authorization, or how would you go about getting that? Minneapolis Center is the one that's going to grant you authorization to get into that airspace. Now they will probably most likely coordinate with Fort Ripley, Camp Ripley in that area, but that's who the controlling agency is, Minneapolis Center, and that's how you find out. That's the same for prohibited area, restricted area, um, a lot of military operations areas are the same way. This rule 107.47 is the TFR rule. Uh, essentially we identify, like you're now starting to get used to, we redirect you to part 91, 137 through 145 and 99.7, what really amounts to TFRs. So you may not operate a UAS in TFRs, uh, whether it's a, in the vicinity of a disaster hazard area, national disaster areas in the state of Hawaii, emergency air traffic rules, uh, flying too close to the President of the United States or other dignitaries. Um, flying too close to where they're doing space launches off of Cape Canaveral, um, or we have a rule for abnormally high barometric pressure conditions. There's also kind of the permanent TFR that exists, which is the stadium TFR, people like to call it, that exists over certain stadiums of a seating capacity and type of venue. Um, regardless of which TFR it happens to be, no UAS operations are permitted inside a TFR. I got a couple more on here, I guess, uh, but, but essentially they're saying the same thing. TFRs, no fly. If you got a TFR active in the area, you're not going to go flying that particular day. And, I, and I'll show you how to find out here uh, later on. You are required to do a pre-flight on the UA. You can't just unpack it out of its uh, shipping crate or unpack it out of its protective case and, and launch it. You have to, as the remote pilot in command, assess the operating environment, consider all the risks to people or property, in the immediate vicinity, on the surface, and in the air. These are things that you have to do prior to flight. Not just one flight, all flights you have to complete this. Your assessment must include local weather conditions, airspace, and any flight restrictions, i.e. TFRs, uh, the locations of people or property on the surface, any other ground hazards which may play a role in your operation. And you must ensure that everybody directly participating in the UA operation informed about the operating conditions, emergency procedures, so on and so forth. This gets back to you, people who are participating in the direct operation of your small unmanned aircraft, back when we were talking about operating over people. This is the briefing that you have to give them. You have to ensure that anybody participating in that oper safe operation knows the operating conditions, emergency procedures, contingency procedures, roles and responsibilities, potential hazards. That's your responsibility as a remote pilot in command. There's a lot of responsibility on your shoulders. You have to ensure that all control links between the station and the unmanned aircraft are working properly, and you must ensure that it has enough power to fly for your intended mission. This is similar to manned aircraft pilots, making sure there's enough gas in the tank to get where they're going. 
and make sure that anything you've got mounted on the bottom, GoPro cam or whatever type of uh, video device or sensing device doesn't fall off, uh, is essentially what that boils down to. We provide a lot of publications on this. We have uh, topics on aviation weather, aircraft loading performance, emergency procedures, ADM, airspace. These are all free. You don't need to pay for any of these. If you go to our FAA website and you find the handbook section or use Google and just type FAA handbooks, all of them are in PDF format. All of them are free. Uh, you can download that, put it in your, your tablet or computer, whatever device you want to use. All right. But in addition to all that, make sure that the device is capable of flight. Do the, the, the propellers operate as they should? Do the control system operate as they should? Do you have adequate power? Um, so on and so forth. Um, you make sure that whatever you have at the bottom doesn't fall off, and then make sure that you have documentation with you. If you're operating under a waiver, you're going to want that waiver with you. Uh, you're going to want your remote pilot certificate with you. You're going to want the aircraft registration with you. These are all things you have to have ready to go. You need to have these documents with you. Operating limitations. So here's kind of the nuts and bolts of, of the actual flying of the device. We limit it to a ground speed of no more than 100 miles an hour, and you have to have at least three miles of visibility observed from the location of the control station. So wherever you're at, you have to determine uh, my flight visibility is at least three miles. You cannot fly higher than 400 feet AGL unless you're within 400 foot radius of a structure. Then you may fly up to the top plus 400 feet above that structure's uppermost limit. If the, if the radio antenna is 1,000 feet tall, you may operate within 400 foot radius of that up to 1,400 feet AGL. That's what this rule permits you to do. You do have to maintain cloud clearances. Uh, you have to be at least 500 feet below and 2,000 feet to the side of any cloud. You, you cannot fly above the cloud. So why do we have these? Well, among other things, we want you to have an ability to have time to make adjustments. You identify hazards and react to that to make sure that you're maintaining safety and taking appropriate actions. A lot of different ways to determine ground speed. Quite frankly, if you own and operate a UAS, you know the best way for you to determine ground speed, but that's the controlling factor, ground speed. Same thing with altitude. We, most of these references are an AGL above ground level, but you really want to understand the difference between MSL and AGL altitudes. If you don't, time to hit the books. But again, determining altitude, probably best left to you guys as you know the UAS system the best and how it relates that information to you. Cloud clearances, how do we do that? Your eyeballs are probably the worst calibrated, they're not calibrated, worst uncalibrated tool to determine cloud clearances. So the best way to do that is to obtain local weather reports in an aviation format. Where are the clouds at? What, what are the bases of the clouds at? Because if I know the bases are at 1,000 feet, I know that I have to be 500 feet below that, so I'm going to be limited. Even if I'm within 400 foot radius of a structure, I'll be limited to 500 feet AGL max because of the clouds where they're sitting at. Don't forget your local laws and regs, all right? Just the state of Minnesota, I can tell you, they're going to require that you register your UAS with them, that you're going to have a commercial operating license with them, and that you're going to have to prove minimum insurance requirements to them. The FAA does not require insurance. We don't require a commercial operator license, so to speak. We issue registrations for five bucks, and we issue remote pilot certificates. That's our requirement. But every state's going to have their own set of rules, and if they don't have them now, they probably will very soon. Check with your state. Just because you've met all the FAA requirements doesn't mean you've met your state requirements. I can't emphasize enough. We don't regulate privacy at the FAA. That's not what we do. It's not what we have regulations for. But many in city and states do, and they have very specific privacy laws. And you're kidding yourself if you don't think they're talking about how to control privacy with drones right now, because they are. I've been involved with legislatures here in the state of Minnesota. It is a topic that is being discussed right now. So know your local laws. Extremely, extremely important. All right, one more quiz here um, as we close out this section. And this should be an easy one for you guys if uh, you've been paying attention at all uh, during the first portion of the uh, presentation.
All right, wrapping this one up here, I'm going to close it out, uh, maybe just a uh, skosh early here. Um, the answer is the remote pilot in command. They are the one with the responsibility and final authority to the operation of the UAS. Remember, the remote pilot certificate gives you the authority to operate it. The remote pilot in command is responsible for all.